I suppose most of you have already know about the story of the green stone. Could you put your hands up, those who don't? So it's no... Oh, okay, for those people who don't, I'll, I'd better very briefly explain what happened. And this is a very, very brief explanation of it. Um, most of you, I suppose, have seen the film that I made, the half-hour film. Anybody not seen it? Just a couple of people. Okay, so most of you, even, you haven't, even if you haven't read the book, will probably know what it's about. Sorry? You can't hear me? What? Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, the thing began with myself and Andrew Collins, Andy, were living in a house, an old Victorian, rambling old Victorian house in this city of Wolverhampton. We were using it as the headquarters of the magazine that Andy mentioned, Strange Phenomena, and also we, <coughs> also we were um, running, we ran a paranormal research group from there called Parasearch. And one of the things that we investigated was the story of a lost green gemstone that was said to have belonged to Mary Queen of Scots and had been hidden for over 400 years. And this stone was supposed to have strange supernatural properties and it was supposedly hidden by a group called the Order of Nehemiah, a secret society that was believed to have been set up by Dr. John Dee, the Elizabethan astro astrologer and occultist. And this group hid this stone in 1605 after the gunpowder plot. And we were told that various people were involved in this, such as Sir Walter Raleigh and Robert Catesby, who was actually the leader of the gunpowder plotters, after the gunpowder plot went completely wrong, the stone was hidden and a series of clues were left to reveal its location in an old Tudor building called uh, Harvington Hall in the county of Worcestershire. Now, how we got all this information, I'll come on to in a moment because it's all very important, but I'm just giving you a basic outline of the whole thing. Um, myself and Andy went to Harvington Hall and discovered when we got there that during recent renovations to the old building, people had found behind an upstairs corridor, behind wood panelling that had been sealed up for 400 years, there was a big wall mural or painting called the um, called the Nine Worthies and we decided that this had got to have been the series of clues left by the owner of the house a man called Humphrey Packington in 1605 because it dated from that time and it had been deliberately boarded up so quite clearly um, someone had wanted them preserved wanted this painting preserved the central image depicted a youthful King Arthur wielding the magic sword Excalibur and behind him his knights are gathered on a hill. We ultimately realised that this referred to a place nearby, a feature in the local landscape called Knight's Hill. Knights gathered on a hill, Knight's Hill. It's only a few miles away from Harvington Hall. And then we, we realised, and this wasn't not until much later on, but eventually from the people who owned the land discovered that right below this Knight's Hill there was an old footbridge dating from the time that the paintings were written, uh, painted, about 1600. And this old footbridge um, was known locally as Arthur's Bridge. So that's a very short version of it. 
That wasn't discovered until later, but I'm giving you the kind of point of view of the whole thing as, a, as an overall idea firstly, and then I'll explain sort of how it all came about. So, in the painting you've got a, a, a youthful King Arthur wielding Excalibur, and behind him his knights are gathered on a hill. Nearby there's a hill called Knight's Hill, and below it a bridge called Arthur's Bridge. Um, and in the painting, when Arthur is actually, if you look at him, he's looking down and to his left. And if you stood on this small bridge which overlooks a lake, with the Knight's Hill behind you to your left, like in the painting of King Arthur, there he is with the sword, and the Knights are over his left shoulder, if you have Knight's Hill behind you on your left shoulder, um, and then look down and to your left, you'll end up at the foundations of the bridge. And ultimately, we decided, I think it was Andy who eventually came up with the idea, that we may search nine stones along and nine stones down from the bridge. And when we did this, and the whole thing was completely covered in uh, old vegetation and brambles, and you know, the, the, there's clearly nobody had moved this stone for years. When we removed the stone, behind it, we saw there was clearly what was either a short sword or long dagger. Now, this was taken, this was cleaned up. It was covered in years of silt and sediment. I mean, it took a long time to clean it up. It seemed to have been covered in some kind of lacquer as well that kept it preserved. It was taken to the Chester House Museum, uh, sorry, the Grosvenor House Museum in the city of Chester, and examined by experts who said it was basically, it was, it was about 20 inches long with a two inch cross guard made out of a single piece of molded steel. And on the cross guard, there was embossed the personal coat of arms of one of the very people who was said to have once possessed this green stone we were looking for, Mary, Queen of Scots. And along the blade of the sword were written in Elizabethan English three words, me and I are for Mary. Now, remember that the group that had this stone was called the Order of Me and I. The stone was supposed to belong to Mary, Queen of Scots. So we'd clearly solved some kind of 400-year-old puzzle. But why haven't we found a stone? Okay, this is now when I'll explain to you how the psychic stuff starts to come into it. We've got something there at the moment which is straightforward historical investigation, if you like. Pretty exciting, but it's all about following clues. And remember, this was happening years before the Indiana Jones films or things like the Da Vinci Code. This was back in 1979. 40 years ago, as Andy said, at this very time of the year. We, first of all, there were a number of people that we got to know who were quite, what would you call them, psychic or mediums, by, inve by doing the investigations for the magazine. And a lot of these people visited the headquarters, these Old, Elizabeth, old Victorian rambling mansion, which is, I don't know, about a mile away from here, number 19 Oaks Crescent. Today it's been converted into apartments, but uh, quite luxury apartments. But back then we had like the bottom half of this house. And it was used as the magazine offices. A lot of people visited us. We got in touch with a lot of people who were psychic because we were running tests with them, people did seances, you name it. So there was quite a lot of this, we knew quite a lot of people who had had paranormal experiences of one sort or another. When, I, I can't, I haven't read the Green Stone book since it was originally written. This, I've written a new introduction to it and I've included a lot of new photographs but Martin Keatman, my co-author, was the one who did all the editing. I unfortunately had to get another book out at that time. So some of the actual order of events, you, some of you might be more au fait with than I am because you've just read them and I haven't. But I seem to remember it kind of started when Andy decided to try a hypnosis experiment with me. Now he just kind of learned how to do it out of a book. Um, and um, 
I, I was quite drunk anyway. I, we'd just been in the office. I, I think we were celebrating one of the issues of the magazine coming out. And I, um, basically, I, as far as I know, he was, Andy used to have a technique called hypnosis by boredom. <laughs> basically, just repeat the same thing over and over again until you went to sleep. Well, that happened. And because I'd, you know, been drinking also, I'd, as far as I know, that's it. I'd just fallen asleep. But what's really weird is, I woke up to Andy going, oh my God, Graham, you won't believe it, you won't believe it. You were just talking in a whispering voice. I said, well, yeah. I thought, okay, fine. He said, but you were talking about a green stone that had been hidden called the Meaniah Stone and a group called the Order of Meaniah that had it. And so all the information that I've been giving you just now, first of all, came out through me in a drunken hypnotic state is all I can say. Now, I had not had anything like this happen to me before, you know, psychic impressions or anything like that, although I'd been fascinated by the paranormal. But completely, so, but the weird thing is, I'd have just put it down to it's my own concept. Now, since that time, obviously, I've investigated all sorts of historical mysteries, as has Andy. But at that point, we were interested in the paranormal, and history really didn't come into it. So where I'd have got all this information in my head, I don't know, but I thought, okay, maybe I've read some stuff, it's stuck there, it's come out under hypnosis, that's very possible. But when Andy started to play the tape back to me, of my own voice speaking, in like a whispering voice, I thought, this is like weird, because I don't sound like I'm drunk or anything, I'm speaking very, so, but it goes off, it, you can just hear me for a few seconds, and then there's nothing else on the tape. It, and Andy said, you said something, I said, well, where, where did this green stone supposedly come from then? And he said, well, you whisp your whispering voice said, that it came originally from ancient Egypt and it belonged to um, Pharaoh, but I can't remember what his name was. And at that moment, the only thing recorded on the tape was my voice going, Akhenaten, Akhenaten, Akhenaten. And I repeated that voice and Andy said, no point during the trance that you were in, or whatever you want to call it, did you actually say the word Akhenaten like that? And it was this real weird echoey voice. But it's my voice saying it, but he said, you never repeated his voice three times like that. So, anyway, that made me think, well, something weird's going on. But what really got me was that a f this wasn't somebody who's directly even involved with the parasearch group or with strange phenomena. A uh, man by the name of Alan Beard, who was a family friend of one of the investigators, who had no direct connection with us at all, and try and picture 40 years ago, there wasn't the internet. Everybody didn't have mobile phones. So people getting in touch with each other and sharing some kind of secret or working in cahoots, it's, it's going to be very difficult. This guy came from up in Cheshire, Alsager to be precise. And Alan Beard, what he did was one day he just phoned up Terry Shotton, who was the investigator working with our magazine, psychical researcher and he said to him I've just been sitting at home and suddenly in my in my mind's eye I have seen like a, a white light which formed into the image of a old green stone set in a silver ring a green stone in a silver ring now he had no idea nobody except for myself and Andy Terry Shotton didn't know nobody else knew about me going on about a green stone we should find in this trance or whatever it was but Alan Beard who had never had another psychic experience in his life had suddenly kind of woken up seeing like this green stone so we thought wow I mean how is this happening now most I've explained earlier how we actually went about how, how the clues at, at Harvington Hall would lead to where we looked in the bridge. But at the time, we weren't aware of all this. We didn't know that that bridge was known locally as Arthur's Bridge. We didn't realise that um, the Arthur figure looking down and to his left um, with the hill behind him as the position that you'd have to stand in, that's all been worked out since or discovered since. It's only even recently since that property has been sold and now owned by the National Trust. 
that they have, they have done the research historically to find out that it was known as Arthur's Bridge. It was paranormal psychic messages, if you like, that were helping us find that sword. First of all, Alan Beard, the same guy who'd seen this green stone, completely independent me of me talking about it, said that he suddenly he, he, he has this impression, this, again, he calls them psychic impressions. It's not exactly a vision, but it's in his mind's eye. And he sees a holly bush, and he said, you've got to go to a place where there's a holly bush. He also sees a lake, and he said that this is where you've got to go. But you're not looking for a stone at this point, but a sword that will lead you to the stone. Now, when he, when he phoned up the office and told us about this, we were absolutely gobsmacked because... Andrew and I had just seen the King Arthur sword in the picture, and nobody, apart from us too, knew anything about a sword being involved in this search. It was all to do with a stone. Well, Alan Beard had had no idea about the stone when he'd first seen the green stone, and then secondly, he'd had absolutely no idea we were, that even a sword had anything to do with it. But it wasn't just him. Marion Sunderland, who was another of the people involved with the group, she was a, a psychic lady. Her daughter had had a UFO experience. We'd interviewed her about that. She had a dream. I mean, she lived up in North Wales. These people were just completely unknown to each other. And although myself and Andy were in our mid-twenties at the time, a lot of these people were a lot older than us. They were different age groups, different kind of backgrounds. Marion Sunderland was um, basically just an ordinary, everyday... I mean, you wouldn't use the word housewife anymore, but that's what they used to call them back then. Her husband was... She was just an ordinary, everyday lady. Um, Alan Beard was a, a telephone engineer who basically... Uh, there was no way that they mixed in the same circles or could have known each other. Marion has a dream about a very still lake, just like Alan Beard's vision. She then also sees a sword. Now she, she felt compelled to phone and tell us about all this. She had no idea what Alan Beard had seen. She had no idea what we were doing. And she said that she sees this sword lying on top of a stone slab and that it's very important we should find this sword and that this sword would somehow lead us to the green stone. So when we found the sword, we already had been told by two people completely independently, there may be more, I seem to, think, I seem to remember there's a couple of other people also referred to this sword. But when we actually, and it was night time by the time we actually got this stone out of the bridge, and saw this um, small alcove behind it with the sword on it. Um, it was night time at this point, and when we shone the torch, the flashlight inside, and you could see there was clearly what was a sword. I mean, we'd been told this by at least two, maybe more, people who had seen it in dreams or had had psychic impressions about it. So, and the very way, the way we actually worked out nine stones along and nine stones down, I think was basically just due to some intuition that Andy had in his head. And why we went to that bridge, the only reason we went to that bridge was because it was with Night Hill. We knew that Night Hill was important. And obviously there's King Arthur with his sword, Knights of the Round Table. And it's the only thing that was anywhere around there that seemed to have been of the right age, um, the early 1600s. So that's why we chose the bridge. Um, and I think Andy just had a complete intuition, nine across, nine down. It all makes sense since, but at the time it was primarily paranormal stuff that seemed to want us to find this green stone. Okay, so we've got a sword. I mean, what on earth is the purpose of this sword? I mean, how is it going to help us find the stone? Well. The way it helped us, again, it was completely psychic, but since that time, we've been able to work out exactly how the sword would lead you to find the stone if you weren't getting psychic messages. I'll tell you about the psychic messages first. Marion Sunderland's daughter, who was 12 at the time, Gaynor, she 
said to her mother that she felt that if she went to the bridge where the sword was found and held the bridge, I'm sorry, held the sword, that she could use it sort of like a divining rod to lead to where the stone was hidden. So we thought, okay, why not? So she kind of said, like, it's over there somewhere. It's a couple of miles over there. I see a castle. We've got to go there. And she, I mean, the girl was young. She didn't, have, I mean, there's no access to the internet then. She wouldn't have known what was over that, you know, over the hill. We went there and we found there was this old ruined castle. It's a folly, actually, built in the 1800s, I think. But anyway, it was just as she described. And Andy and Gaynor both went up inside this um, tower of this mock ruined castle <clears throat> and suddenly there was this almighty noise up there like a big bird um, and they all came racing down thinking there was going to be something there that would peck their eyes out. That night after going up that tower Gaina had a dream that she was repeat, re reliving the day's experiences, walking, up, uh, climbing up this spiral staircase inside this tower that she'd been led to by holding the sword. And then she dreamt that she heard this noise up there again, and she saw that it was a huge, great big swan that had nested at the top of this tower. This was the dream she had. And then the swan flew out of the tower, and round its neck there was a pouch. And she knew in her dream that the pouch was around the swan's neck. That's what she said. Now, incredibly, we had been looking at a map. Um, we were actually at, we went up to Marion's house because she was getting some of the most astonishing, um, accurate, uh, paranormal visions, if you like, when we found the sword. It was not only on a stone slab, exactly as she said, but she told us that when we found it, we would, we would be in the right place because there would be a s overwhelming smell of rotting vegetation. And that is exactly what we, it was like where we found the sword. It literally, all this old rotting vegetation on the edge of the lake, at which this bridge overlooked, absolutely stank. This is what she'd kind of had, a, she'd smelt this in her vision. So she was pretty accurate. Alan Beard, remember I said to you, he said he saw a holly bush nearby and directly above where we actually looked or found that, you know, the stone we moved, there was a big holly bush. I think that's actually why we decided that we was going to pull that stone out nine across, nine down because of this holly bush. So Alan Beard and Marion and a number of others that had had psychic impressions or dreams, we'd gathered them all at Marion's house and we were looking at the map and Marion's husband, Fred, was looking. He said, well, I think Gaynor or somebody had had a dream whereby they'd seen somebody running and trying to hide this stone after the gunpowder plot. Why were they hiding it? Because they were involved in the gunpowder plot and everybody involved in the gunpowder plot was being hunted down to be hanged, drawn and quartered, basically. So she'd seen a bit of this in a dream. And I think Marion's husband, Fred, was trying to work out what kind of you know, are there any features on the landscape that fit with this running man? And he basically, he, he, he put a circle on the map of the likely area that seemed to tie up with what Gaynor had seen in this vision. Marion had seen, she'd had another vision, dream, of a meander in a river, a big bend in a, big, in a, in a river. And beside it, she saw an avenue of trees. And she said, that is where you will find the stone. So based on all that, Fred had actually seen a bend in the River Avon. And he thought, oh, that could match with what Marion had seen. That could match with Gaynor's vision of a running man. That's the, that's the, 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 the landscape seems the same. And, at the, and he, put a little, he drew a circle on the map. And at that moment, Gaynor came downstairs, having just woken up, and she said, everyone's got shocked. She said, I've just had a dream. You'll find the swan around, you'll find the stone around the swan's neck. And the place that Fred had drawn a circle around on the map, this bend in the River Avon, is called the swan's neck. So 
Gain, Gainer's vision, somehow inspired by clambering up this tower and seeing a swan fly out. I mean, there really had been some kind of bird up there the day before, whether it was a swan or not, who knows. But that had inspired her vision that led us to the swan's neck. And it, this is, I won't go on too much about it because it's a very long story, but cutting a long story short, at a mound at the end of this avenue of trees, exactly as Marion described, about three, four feet down, we uncovered this brass casket that's about eight inches long, four inches wide, four inches deep. And it was a heavy brass casket. Again, it was covered in years of silt and sediment. Um, it was taken to the Chester, the same museum in Chester, and they said that it dated from the late 1500s. So it could very well have belonged to Mary Queen of Scots and all the people involved in the gunpowder plot around 1600, 1605. And inside this heavy brass casket, there was a small green stone. It was about three quarters of an inch long, about half an inch wide, flat on the one side and rounded on the other, as you would find set in a ring. But it wasn't made of some weird supernatural material or some element not known on Earth. It was simply made of just jade. It was a, a variegated shades of, of color. It was simple jade. Um, now, what's we were told about this through various people's psychic messages that it held all sorts of strange supernatural powers. I'll come on to that in a moment. But let me explain some of the other things we found out about. When we started to tell people that, well, we'd found this stone and it seems to have belonged to a society called the Order of Nehemiah that had included people like Walter Raleigh and it included people like Robert Catesby, they would say, hold on, no, 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 no. Robert Catesby was a Catholic activist, Sir Walter Raleigh was a Protestant, stroke almost atheist. Um, these Protestants and Catholics would not be working together at that time. But many years later, um, a lady who's a friend of mine on Facebook, Valerie Walters, managed to find a place that proved that Raleigh, Catesby, John D. and loads of others really were involved in a strange secret society. And it seems to have been the place that this order of me and I met. It is a, um, a, uh, a, Vic, a, a, a Elizabethan Tudor mansion called Cannon's Ashby House near the town of Daventry in Northamptonshire. And it is... Um, a, 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 new, a room was discovered when, they, when the place was opened, by the, opened up to the National Trust. And it's a chamber about, I don't know, it's about uh, 12 feet wide, 15, 20 feet long. And on the walls of this chamber are all the coat of arms of the people who are said to have met there. In the, and they date from around about 1600, 1590s, 1600. And it's got the coat of arms of all those who met at this place. Now, OK, at first they thought, well, these are people just meeting together, local landowners, trying to uh, discuss financial matters in secret. But, what's that for? Oh, God. Hello? 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 Right. And um, what was I on about? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, there's a coat of arms all over this wall. Now, you'd think, OK, it's just a, a, a group of people meeting to discuss financial matters. But in one corner, right by the door, they discovered, again, something that had been sealed up since the early 1600s behind lath and plaster. There was this alcove. Uh, it kind of looked like a fireplace, except there was no chimney. And the bottom half of the alcove, and the, the top half, it, on, on the top half of it, it's got two pillars um, either side with an arch over the top. And in the corner, there are these two red L-shaped things. And down below, there are these two inverted V-shaped things, which immediately they were seen. People said, they're Masonic signs, the dividers, the um, compass not to be confused with the thing that you uh, fire magnetic north with 
is um, an object for inscribing circles or for measuring distances on maps. And the L-shaped thing is known as a square, rather confusingly. And these are the, were, were uh, instruments used by stonemasons, and hence is why the Freemasons use them for their symbols. But what's a, that, so of course everybody said this is an early Masonic meeting hall because what this little alcove was for was to hold a basin where one could ritually wash your hands before the meeting started. They were common in Masonic halls at that time. Now, remember this dates from the fifth, uh, 1590s. The oldest lodge in England, Masonic Lodge, is in 1717. Many years later, there are some early lodges in Scotland, but there is another group. So the, the thing is, it, I said to the people of Canons Ashby House when I first went there, this isn't Masonic, and they agreed with me. They said, no, it's too early to be Masonic. But there was another group of people who did use this same kind of symbolism and did have these ritual washing basins. And that was a group known as the Rosicrucians, who basically were a secret society in the early 1600s. But, so, okay, so you've got some occult, and then they, they were a group that practiced, or at least professed to practice, some form of occultism, better known as Kabbalism. It's an ancient form of Jewish mysticism that's supposed to have been revealed to the stonemasons who built the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem to have been revealed to them by angels. And in the Middle Ages, there were lots of these books written called grimoires, full of magic spells to open portals to other realities, how to make yourself psychic, to read minds, to do all, how to summon angels, banish demons. And basically, the, these Rosicrucians around 1600 were massively into all this. And they used these same Masonic signs because they believed that, they, that the knowledge they had originated in the temple of, of, of Jerusalem with the, with the, free mate, with, with the early uh, Masons that built the temple of Jerusalem. Okay, so the thing is that so you've got some early kind of occult group that met at Canons Ashby House in this room, and we knew who they all were because their coat of arms are on the wall. And there, right next to Sir Walter Raleigh, who we knew was right heavily involved in this order of me and I, if all the psychic messages were correct, and, and um, Robert Catesby, the Catholic, the one who was in charge of the gunpowder plot to blow up King James and his parliament, his coat of arms is there too. So people who said to us at the time, oh, no, no, you can't, you can't have these Protestants and Catholics working together. No, they were. Specifically, Catesby and Raleigh. And this had only just been discovered. It had only been discovered. It wasn't even known about. This room wasn't there or at least wasn't open to the public, and the, the wash basin, um, this alcove, and, and the, uh, the coat of arms on the walls, they hadn't even been discovered when I was having these, this weird um, trance, whatever you want to call it, that Andy had put me into, when Marion and, and Alan Beard were having dreams and visions and all that. It did fit. But what's more incredible is that the other people whose names appear, whose shields are upon the wall, are known occultists. Robert Flood, you probably might not know who he is, but he was thought to have been the author of one of the most important Rosicrucian documents known as the Famer. Um, there is also, yes, believe it or not, Dr. John Dee himself, the most famous occultist of the 1500s. There are, and they're all there, all these known occultists, along with our good friend Robert Catesby, who everyone said he was a Catholic activist, he had nothing to do whatsoever with, with, with the occult. Well, he did, and it's proved in that room. But that's only in recent years we've found that out. So, going back to the, the stone itself, most of how we'd actually, I mean, it, so now we know that how do we know that, for a start, that this group was called the Order of Me and Aya? Well, on the sword, there was written, Me and Aya for Mary. 
But that doesn't prove that the group was called me and I. Um, that could be the name of the stone. It could be anything. Um, but since then, and it's only in the last year, I have found absolute proof, evidence written, that the order of me and I existed. But back then, we had no proof. Okay, I'm going to come back onto that in a moment. Okay, going back to the stone. Remember how we found it was purely simply people having sh different bits of clues in dreams, messages. How we've since realized how this is how the clues would have played out if we hadn't had psychic impressions. The stone was found in the swan's neck. The swan was extremely important to the order of Mianaya. The reason being that Dr. John Dee is known to have founded a secret society that included people like Sir Walter Raleigh in the mid-1500s. And this is known about, people refer to it as the School of Night after a, um, after a reference in one of Shakespeare's plays. And the School of Night was um, the name that people, historians, have labelled Walter Raleigh and John Dee's Secret Society. It was inspired by a new star, actually a supernova, that appeared in 1572 in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. Now, Dee took that to be a sign that a new age was about to begin, a new age of enlightenment. And it was the time of new discoveries being made. The British first, uh, first English colony in America. It's the age of Shakespeare in the beginning of theatre. And it's the age almost coming around shortly after that of Galileo in the beginning of science. So this group kind of got together to, because this star, this new star had appeared, they, uh, the only thing that they knew of such a star before was in the Bible where it uh, heralded the birth of Christ. So they thought, right, a star appearing in a swan, it's a symbol for a new age of enlightenment. Um, also, Andrew has done a lot of research showing that Meaniah, the actual name Meaniah, comes from a place in, in what's now Turkey that the Greeks later called Lydia, which included the city of Troy. Meaniah was an early name for this kingdom. And uh, this kingdom was once ruled by a a priestess queen named Omphale who is said to have had the power to create magic stones. Um, also, uh, Andy will probably mention later, about the swans of Meaniah. So swans were always associated. They represented the muses of early Greek culture in, in, in this area called Meaniah. So obviously, the, 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 so we've got all that tying in together. Right, going back to the, so a, a, a star, a new star, actually as I say a supernova, appearing in the constellation of Cygnus. It's a rare event. There's only been one le other supernova visible with the naked eye seen since that time. But in 1600, another new star appeared. This time it wasn't an exploding star, but the rare brightening of an existing star. And it's recorded by Johann Kepler, one of the first true astronomers rather than astrologers, in his book. And he's included the whole thing in there. He's got a map of the, of the constellation it appeared in. It again, once again, appeared in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. So this society that Raleigh and Dee started, that included people like Robert Flood and, and Robert Catesby and all the rest of them, must have been knocked out when in 1600 another star appears in Cygnus the Swan. And where does it appear in the swan, in the star map? In the swan's neck. So it was clearly that anybody who would have known about the, had been a member of the society, but had gone underground after the abortive gunpowder plot of 1605, which Catesby seems to have led himself, People like Raleigh and that, well, he, he was locked up in prison by then for being, a, for being an atheist. 
um, James I was on the throne. Um, he was, he was, he was, um, uh, was passing all sorts, well, you know, forcing through all sorts of laws against Catholics. So Robert Catesby and a few of his friends decided to blow up the Parliament building. The, the, the others weren't involved in all that. But anyway, that's when this, uh, the stone was hidden after this. And um, anybody who had been a member of that group in the future who thought, right, they've hidden this stone, where could it be? If they were led firstly to a sword, the word me and I are for Mary would make them realize that they were thinking of the swans of me and I are. And anyone who knew about how the whole thing started off with a swan and that a star had appeared just recently in the swan's neck would have known to look there. It, I'm saying that as simply as I can. It is much more complicated than that, and I could go on for ages. But what I'm trying to explain is that in the years since, we were just getting psychic messages and dreams and so forth, all about this, um, you know, how we ought to find this stone. Since that time, all sorts of historical proof has come about that we just couldn't have known about, that nobody knew about. Of course, the question is, where were all these psychic messages coming from? In my case, and it's, this is the weird thing, my whispering voice didn't claim to be the spirit of some long dead ancestor or some, um, you know, some guru from the past or something, or even a, an entity. No, it claimed to be a girl that I'd known at college. I hadn't even known her that well, a girl called Joanna. Now, I said to Andy, what? She said, well, it was a whispering voice, it was your voice, but she claimed, it claimed that some kind of external influence was channeling through Joanna's mind, wherever she was, and then to me. And I said, that's just nuts. So we eventually, cutting a very long story short, we managed to trace where she lived, and she was living down in Cornwall, and me and Andy went there and found that she was living in the middle of a stone circle. And she was, um, she actually remembers Andy's face. She remembers like, she couldn't remember exactly what she was saying, but she did remember that something had happened. And I think she described the room, the front room at the Oaks Crescent headquarters where we'd been doing all this. Um, so, but she had no idea what all that was about. Why, and, and, and since then, no, nope, she's never had anything to do with it since, never seen her since, she's never come up with it. I've never gone off again and whispered as, a, as, as this Joanna. Everything that people were getting, it was like Alan Beard. Uh, he'd never had a paranormal experience in his life. He wasn't even interested in it. And suddenly he has this vision while he's just sitting on, in his office or in his front room or something. Um, and then people are getting dreams and where's it all coming from? Okay, right. So let's go back now to this order of me and I. What, if you've read the Greenstone book, you'll see that towards the end, we find out that another group, again, this is all psychic impressions that people are getting. I can't remember who, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of people getting these psychic impressions. I've only just mentioned a few of them. And if any of you haven't seen my half hour video yet, that's on my Graham Phillips author YouTube, you will be able to see on there that some of these people being interviewed just a couple of years after all this happened. And you'll see that they're sensible people in suits. They're not all crazy types. Yes, Martin Keatland's an old a sort of student with his hair all over the place. I've got a head, at, head which, you know, a haircut that looks like a microphone. Um, <laughs> and he's got a moustache. But we're young. Most of these people, what, like 50 or 60 years old, it's so many different types of people involved in all this that would never normally get together. So, would never normally get together. So anyway, we, so some, amongst all these people, people were getting visions or dreams about the Order of Mianaya being either refounded or continuing to exist during the Victorian era. And that they'd had something and they'd had something to do with the house that we were using as the headquarters. Now, nobody at that time could prove. Now, that we were told that the head of this order, by the late uh, 19th century, was a woman by the name of Mary Heath, who came from 
Bidolf Grange in the north of Staffordshire. Here, you're in the very south of Staffordshire, a couple of miles over there, and you're into Worcestershire. This is at the very other end of Staffordshire, just north of Stoke-on-Trent, Bidolf Grange, an old, Vic big Victorian mansion. And the, this Mary Heath that lived there was in charge of the Order of Mianaya. Well, the thing is that, search as we might, we couldn't find any reference to a Mary Heath. There was a Laura Heath who was there, but no Mary. The people that before that were called the Batemans. There was no Mary Heath. But now, since modern people have done, since people have, in more modern times, have done a hell of a lot of uh, geology, there's endless uh, geology, uh, genealogy websites, family trees that people have done. They've dug up all sorts of um, people that you couldn't have known about 40 years ago. Mary Heath, yes, she did exist. Not only did she run the house in, um, in the 1870s, just as we were told, but she's actually buried in the local churchyard. How we overlook that, I have no idea, but that's another story. I'm like working on a book at the moment about how reality keeps changing, but that is another story and a bit too much to swallow at the moment, I think. Um, but returning to this, Mary Heath did exist, but we didn't know this at the time. Now you can look her up online. Right, that's, that's number one. How did people even know about this woman and get them psychic messages about her? Number two, it's only just recently that I have been tracing up the descendants of the Heath family. And in amongst their papers, I have now got absolute proof that they did have a group called the Order of Mianaya in the late 1800s. I can't tell you the whole thing now because it's my new book that will come out after Christmas. But, there's, um, but there was a, um, what you call, a memorial service which was held for Mary Heath after her death. And all the people that were known to her, her friends and family, wrote tributes, uh, obituaries. And in this, it refers to her as um, it refers to her as being the queen of not the queen, uh, the pri what was the word it used? Empress something something. Using the same title as this woman that used to be this supreme leader of this ancient place called Mianaya, and it refers quite specifically to Mianaya meetings taking place in the grounds of this house which includes an, a, a mock Egyptian Elizabethan temple that one of the people we knew back then, another of the psychics, Penny Blackwell, told us that these um, rituals used to take place there. Now, again, this is going a bit off track, but it, we should, giving you some idea of some of the weird things that have happened there. Um, we went there around a couple of years ago my friend Angeline, who was at the back somewhere, had this strong impression that there was something behind when, when she was standing in the, in the middle of this like Egyptian temple, more like a tomb really, there's this stone life-size kind of figurine of a baboon. It's called the Ape of Thoth and in Egyptian mythology the ape of Thoth is something like the fool is in Western mythology, or Loki in Norse mythology. This, this, it, he's the trickster of the gods. He's able to set riddles and things like this. So if you wanted to communicate with something really peculiar, you would use the ape of Thoth. Anyway, so Angeline is in that area, standing by where the ape of Thoth is, and she really feels that there's something behind the wall, right to his left, where there's this recess. Now, I thought, fine, okay, we didn't know anything at the time about this, but since, and now this is only a year or two ago, since then, uh, my friend Maya was over here from, um, from America. She filmed the inside of this Egyptian temple. Remember, this is supposed to be where Mary Heath and her friends in the, 18, in the 1800s were carrying on doing these and reform the order of me and I and doing whatever rituals they were supposed to do. Um, she filmed in there, and incredibly, when you look at the film, you can see what appears to be a woman in Victorian clothing just turning as the camp, as uh, she's filming me, 
And I'm going in and talking about the, the, the place and saying this is when it was built and so on and so forth. And as I walk in, suddenly, just as I pass this alcove that Angelina had felt there was something there, you can see this figure turning around. It, it looks for all the world like a woman in, Elizabeth, in, in, in Victorian costume. You can't make out the features. But since that time, We've been back there again. Uh, another time, Maya was there, and she's being filmed by my sister, I think it was at the time, and suddenly, when she's standing in this alcove, she splits into two, and it's no fault of the camera, because one of her looks across at the other one like that and walks out. I mean, it's, also, it's, just, it's, it's almost as if there's like a two double reality taking place in that alcove. And there's a lot more besides all that. I mean, you'll be reading about all that in the new year, and it's not directly relevant to the story of the Green Stone. But what I'm trying to explain is how so many things have happened since that have helped verify things we couldn't possibly have known about them. OK, so now I come on to the stone itself and what it did. Now, we were told by various people that it had... Um, what time is it, by the way? I would, what time do I have to stop talking? Can you very, disc very discreetly, when I've only got five minutes to go, say, you've only got five minutes to go! <laughs> Thank you. Right, okay, so, the stone itself. Now, we'd been told by people that it had got strange supernatural powers. Well, what kind of strange supernatural powers? Well, if it is a stone, this again has been discovered since, but if it is a stone that Dr. John Dee once claimed to have possessed, which is um, a, a green stone known as, it's under various different names, as the Lapis Exilis or the Lapsit Exilis, it's, it, it's, it's basically something that was supposed to have been used by the Archangel Michael to cast the devil into hell. But there's all sorts of legends associated with this green. If it is this green stone that um, John Dee had, um, then it was supposed to have the power to, all I can say is bend reality. Uh, Dr. D doesn't describe it as that, he describes it as having the power to bring about the angel's wishes, to bring spirit, quintessence, and the, f uh, and the four elements of earth together. In other words, it can do anything. Um, it's possibly, and we don't know this for certain, possibly the green stone that's referred to as the Holy Grail. Now, the, there are many different Grail stories. One of them is a concerns a cup that belong to Mary Magdalene. Um, I did a whole book about that one. Um, there's the cup that was used by Christ at the Last Supper. But in one particular story from the Middle Ages, the Holy Grail isn't a cup, but a green stone that's possessed by the Knights Templars, or something called the Templar Sin, who probably seem to be the actual Templars. This was written by a German, um, a German poet called Wolfram von Eckenbach, and in a story called Parsifal, he actually, this written around about, uh, I don't know, 1220, I think, uh, he refers to the Grail actually being a green stone which reveals information. That may be one and the same thing as what Dr. G. D claimed to have, and hence our stone that we found. Okay. So people, so we, it's supposed to have the power to do all sort, sorts of weird stuff. We've been told this by various people, and because we'd had people having visions that proved to be correct, and finding sword where, where, where we were told, and all the rest of it, we are thinking, okay, it's got to do something. Well, at first, nothing really happened. Um, and we've got on with investigating other things. And when the first supernatural events began to take place in the Oaks Crescent headquarters, this old Victorian house, I don't think we, ever, we not, didn't associate it with the stone at first. We just thought the reason why these weird things are happening is because we're, getting, we're bringing together people to do seances and test out their paranormal abilities and whatever. And we've had a lot of mediums in the house, and so consequently, that's kind of woken up some kind of poltergeist activity. That's what we thought at first. But it started simply with people getting electric shocks off various, various appliances in the house, off the cooker or refrigerator, that sort of thing. Well, 
that's nothing weird, but we thought, well, there's obviously something wrong with the wiring system because where you know, the lights kept dimming as well and bulbs would blow far more frequently than you'd expect. So we went along to, um, we got the electric company to come in and check the whole place out and they couldn't find anything to account for it. They said, no, no nothing, nothing wrong with your wiring system. So uh, we just put that down to just weirdness, N nothing associated with paranormal, just weird wiring. But then it got really strange because one night, just as it was getting dark, and it is about this time of the year when it's, well, it's winter time, so it's getting dark at around um, five o'clock or something. So there's still people working in the office. I can't remember who was there at the time. Me, Andy, Martin, and some others. I'm Terry, I don't know who else was there. But suddenly, this strange grey smoke began to fill the whole building. Not only the room that we were in, but behind closed doors and in closets and cupboards. This smoke just was everywhere. And it took about, I don't know, five minutes to fill the whole place. And it sort of like a heavy incense sort of smell. And then after about uh, five minutes, it dissipated just as quickly as it had come. And we were thinking, wow, that was weird. And we thought, there must be something wrong with the wiring now. There's got to be a fire somewhere. We checked the place out. The electric company came back in. Nothing, nothing to account for it. No burnt wiring, nothing. The next night, at exactly the same time, just as it got dark, the smoke was back again. And this happened for a good few days, just as it got dark, this smoke would fill the whole place. And we had loads of people come to witness this. Um, <clears throat> the story about this smoke and these strange accidents even broke in the local newspaper, the w Express and Star, and also the Wolverhampton Chronicle, which got the interest of the ITV Today people, that's the Midland television that used to be at the time. And they sent around a reporter to do a story on this, and it happened to be a young Anne Diamond. So that was, for, that was when she was a reporter for local TV. She came round, she saw it too. I remember meeting her years later at uh, Pebble Mill in Birmingham, and I was saying, do you remember me? I, she said, yeah, you're the editor of that magazine. I said, how do you remember all that then? She said, oh, I don't think that's the only weird thing I've ever seen in my life. So um, she'd never seen ghosts before, but she saw this smoke and no one could account for it. We got it filmed. Unfortunately, going back then, people, people didn't all have um, f f uh, phone cameras and stuff. So, you know, we couldn't, very few people had cine cameras even. So this stuff wasn't recorded, but the sheer number of witnesses is pretty staggering. I mean, we, because this kept happening at the same time every night, we got people to come there and, 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 and witness it. Come there and sort of like, you know, roll up, roll up for the big show and see this smoke. Then things started to take a, a stranger turn because it was at this point that uh, the, the, the wiring started going worse and worse and worse and eventually the electric we got the electricity bill through. Now, I don't know the, the figures, but... I think maybe when we were expecting an electricity bill of like 50 pounds, which would be like, I don't know, let us put it in today's money. We're expecting an electricity bill of around 200 pounds. But what the bill we got would be by, by today's value, about 10,000 pounds. And we thought, what the? So we got, we got the electricity company to come round and they said that they were completely baffled because in their opinion, something like half the street was drawing electricity off the wiring system of the Oaks Crescent headquarters. So of course we weren't going to pay this, so they switched us off. So with the power gone completely, we couldn't use the place anymore for the office of the magazine. We had to run that from elsewhere, we had to move out into, to other places. Um, round the corner, um, I had a place that I used kind of as the office at that point, um, but because we still had some months, I can't remember, maybe a year still remaining on the lease, um, we kept revisiting the, the empty building. And when, at one point, when my co-author of The Green Stone, Martin Keatman, was helping to clear out the property uh, once the electricity had got switched off, he was in the front office 
and suddenly he saw this radio that had belonged to Andy Collins on the shelf above the fireplace and as he was looking at it he saw it rise into the air arc over through the, the through the sky if you like sky through the room and then crash down onto a record player that was Andy Collins's and smash the lid irreparably so wow this was like poltergeist phenomena taking place again at this point we weren't thinking this has got to do with the stone we're assuming that this is because we've grabbed so many people in there uh, you know t taken so many people to the place who have been mediums it's awoken something a poltergeist um, so then a number of other people started to witness strange uh, moving objects. For example, my, myself, for example, I was walking down a passageway, downstairs passageway. Um, there was nobody in the passageway with me. Suddenly, a heavy box of magazines about this big came whizzing past my head and crashed into the door at the other end of the corridor. I mean, this was, this was a real heavy piece, you know, box of magazines. Um, other people, sta people started uh, coming there, started hearing whispering voices and uh, strange singing sounds. And people would come along and they were all giving different accounts. They were, they, sorry, they were all giving similar accounts of what they were hearing and seeing. But ha having had no knowledge beforehand of what other people were seeing. Um, the apparitions started to appear. A strange dark figure. Um, in Victorian clothes with a top hat and a long frock coat, something like how you'd imagine the typical representations of Jack the Ripper. Now, okay, the house is a Victorian house, so you might get the haunting of a Victorian looking figure. But we also started to see what must, can only be described as people with contemporary ghosts, people from 1979, that was the punk era. Some people claim to have seen people in there that were just dressed normally. Uh, Terry Shotton and Alan Beard were there one day, and uh, they saw a lady who they said was just dressed in a, a nightgown from like the late 1970s. In other words, the other alternative versions of the present is, I think, what Alan Beard had a dream that was taking place there. But most weirdly of all was the appearance of what can only be described as an ancient Egyptian princess. Um, this happened, there was uh, three of us there one night, and we, um, we, we, I think we, are, we, were, we didn't know, again at this point, we weren't blaming the stone for the weird things that were happening, but we thought it might be a good idea if we tried to do something with the stone. And this girl, Gaynor, had had this dream about the fact that we could summon some ancient Egyptian princess with it. So we thought, OK, we'll give it a go. So myself, Terry, and a guy called Mike Ratcliffe were in the front room of the Oaks Crescent house. And we got the stone. We had to say some words or something. I can't remember what the full thing was. But it was dark. Why do all these things have to happen in the dark? I don't know. Suddenly, we heard this crashing noise downstairs as if half a wall was being pushed down. And then, it, we, we, we went over to, to, to the, where the, the trap door is, to the cellars underneath the main building, because that's where this crashing noise had come from. And suddenly we hear like footsteps coming up the stairs. Huh. And then, just as we're bending over thinking, it can't be, can't be anybody down there, suddenly the hatch in the floor to the cellars goes <coughs> And we literally belted out there. There's like three fully grown men. I mean, charged down the front drive and out the house. And I'm shut, slammed the door behind me. I mean, some psychical researchers we are. We're getting paranormal phenomena. We're getting poltergeist activity. And we're fleeing for it. In fact, if you read the Greenstone book, I think the word flee is used at least 50 times. Um, so we fled. And we, we, we ended up about as far away. We ended up about as far away from the front window that where, you know, where we'd been, um, from here to, let's say, the other wall, the other end of this room, is this big bay window for the front office. That's where we'd been doing all this thing, and underneath there, just outside that room, is where this trap door was. Now, because the electricity has all been switched off, 
because there is um, it's illuminated only by candles so the curtains are closed and you can see through the curtains that the candles are just still burning in there at this moment there's a guy comes from down the road and he's walking his dog now I happen to know he was an off-duty police officer he just lit a few doors down and he starts to come down the road and as he gets towards me um, you know he, he sees that the three he's just seen the three of us three grown men running down this drive now he thinks there's something going on you know why would we be doing this he says what's going on here and um, I think Terry says to him oh Graham owns, he, he, it's his place you know he said, and I think he said something I don't think there's anybody living here anymore because um, everybody thought that well there's no electricity nobody's living there so Terry's trying to explain that to this guy I'm th I, I, I suddenly have an idea he said well, why did you come running down the, ro the, the drive the, the, per the guy who lived next door to us he kept um, he was always having arguments with his wife and she'd get drunk and throw frying pans at him and things and he'd come running down the drive so the only thing I can think of saying at this point is it's all right mate my wife she goes funny sometimes <laughs> well I didn't have a wife and certainly nobody in the house but just remember that that's what I've said to this guy at this moment we're looking back towards the house and he's still asking questions about what's going on and suddenly it's, it starts to get brighter through the curtains and we're thinking wow this is, you know we've knocked the candles over I'm, this is one thing oh god we've knocked the candles over we're going to get back in there and I'd just slam the front door closed the whole place is going to burn down and then suddenly the curtains begin to twitch and like stage curtains the whole thing just suddenly opens up I kid you not and I'm thinking this is a vision I, this isn't really happening and then I look to the others and they're just staring too including this policeman and his dog <laughs> and literally hovering in the middle of the room was this woman in an Elizabeth uh, with a, uh, a, a, a an ancient Egyptian kind of hairstyle you know the Cleopatra type thing all the makeup but she's completely naked <laughs> and just hanging there this like in, and, and, and we were just gobsmacked and remember I've just said my wife goes funny sometimes <laughs> <laughs> so anyway at this point um, at this point I you know this, uh, this well we all each one of us who saw this is thinking that only we can see it and then when we look at each other we realize wow we, we've actually seen this then suddenly it's as if the whole uh, play, all the candles go out at the same time and the curtains just close again and that's that and when we got back in eventually then there was nothing to account for it but we'd all seen it this this guy I, he just went weird after this the, the guy from up the road the policeman and within about three weeks he'd moved out um, but that was so, but many other weird things happen in that place and it's not your typical haunted house your typical ghost story I mean one occasion uh, myself Martin and Andy were sleeping over in the front room in the same office where this ancient Egyptian princess that we were told was called Sare had actually appeared we were sleeping over there and Andy woke up in the middle of the night to find flames leaping from his sleeping bag now it wasn't a candle that had fallen over there was not no candle anywhere near him he hadn't got a cigarette or anything literally it was as if his sleeping bag had, com had spontaneously combusted and luckily he just managed to get out of it without being hurt in any way it was astonishing and it ended up his photograph of Andy holding his burnt sleeping bag ended up on the front page of the local newspaper you know mysterious accidents occur at paranormal headquarters well people had said well you're all, you're making this up just to sell magazines we didn't we never put anything about this in the magazine how could we it's been years since it's happened and I still don't fully know how to explain this story and it wasn't like your typical haunting what was going on at the same time as this well you've got the Amityville case going on in America and the Enfield haunting down in London but these what was happening to us this that that made those things look like nothing 
How, but, we, but we couldn't explain. It's not your typical haunting. It's got fires. It's got ancient Vict uh, Elizabeth, uh, Egyptian characters, Victorian figures, alternative versions of the present. The, the house itself suddenly started to c collapse from within at an accelerated rate. Uh, plaster fell from the walls. The uh, ceilings collapsed. Pipes rusted and burst. And this all kind of, t it was almost as if, not over like months, but just over a period of weeks, this abandoned house seemed to be rotting from the inside. It was almost as if time was passing at an accelerated rate. Um, we, and it was about this time, eventually, that somebody put two and two together and said, I think that this is being caused by the green stone. Now, the thing is, the green stone was no longer in the house, which is why we didn't really think that it was the green stone that was doing it. I think that was up at Marion's house or Terry Shotton's house or somewhere. It wasn't there anyway. But Marion Sunderland had a dream in which she said, uh, she said that she feels very strongly that the green stone is somehow responsible for these events. It's opened some kind of preternatural rift. And basically, these strange events are just going to get worse, and it's going to spread from just the Oaks Crescent house, and all, so all hell's going to break loose if we don't somehow discharge the stone. Now, we already, we'd already tried a few things with the stone. Um, somebody will be, later on is going to be talking about the nine, nine, nine lights of knowledge. This was something that I think Gaynor came up with, or Marion, or I don't know which particular psychic person came up with this, but that we should take the green stone to, all the, to a, a series of sites along what's known as the St. Michael line. That's a, a, a line of, it, some people believe it's a ley line, it's pretty much a straight line that connects places like Glastonbury, um, Avebury Stone Circle and a few other, uh, the Uffington White Horse and a, a number of ancient sites. And we were to take the stone to each of these sites and charge it up. And when we did this, we, we went back to uh, Oaks Crescent headquarters and we'd be able to get strange paranormal abilities. Well, it did start to work and it was really weird, but it happened different to all of us. We were in the front room one day, myself, Martin and Andy, and suddenly I saw what was like coloured sort of mist tumbling over in the sort of the, by the ceiling. And I said, oh my God, see that? Andy and Martin didn't see this thing tumbling. They heard what they described as heavenly voices tumbling through the air. I was seeing something that they were hearing. On another occasion, uh, one of the people, Barry King, that was involved at the time, he said he saw these two balls of light over by the door, and a few, few seconds later, we saw and recorded, sorry, we heard and recorded two boom, boom, bangs. So as if some people were seeing things, some people were hearing things. Um, and this all happened after we took the green stone along to these gaining what we, we were told were, were the nine lights of knowledge. In other words, there was something at each one of these sites along the St. Michael line uh, that we had to be... And, and that's a story in itself. As I say, some of the later is talking about that. But it was quite phenomenal, some of the things that happened. But the reason I mention this is because uh, we'd already tried to make the green stone do things. Um, but Marion said it was becoming dangerous and we had to discharge the stone. Incidentally, um, not too long ago, I took, I got a hold of a, a jade stone. I tried to find one that was exactly the same as the green stone that we had. I couldn't find the same variegated type, but I got the same kind of jade, jadeite. And I, over a period of weeks, took it to all these sites because I had to get photographs of most of these sites along the St. Michael line for my book, The Wisdom Keepers of Stone Engines, has just come out. So I took this green stone to all these light sites, as they're called, one of them being Avery Stone Circle, another being Glastonbury Tor, and so on. These were the nine light sites. It ends up down at um, uh, St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall. 
just to see if anything would happen, to do the same kind of things as myself and Andy had done when we were trying to power up the stone to start off with, just to see if anything would happen. Well, nothing has happened, but that's what Debbie was saying, or Andy was saying, sorry, earlier on, about there's a stone, uh, a replica of the green stone that, that, that's being raffled off later today um, that was taken to all the sites. So that's what that is. That stone isn't the actual green stone. You're going to hear what happened to that in a minute. Um, but it is this replica. I talked to all the sites to see if it would do anything. Well, it hasn't done anything to me, but it has been to all the sites, and it's made of pretty much the same stuff as the original stone. Anyway, that's, that's by the by. Right. So Marion said, if we do not discharge the stone, it's going to get worse and worse. And to be quite honest, some people were having some pretty frightening experiences. Not me particularly, but Terry Shotton in his house, which is just that south of Stoke-on-Trent. It was having some really weird things happening there. And basically, Marion said, well, you've got to discharge the stone. How can this be done? Well, she said it must be taken to a ha a hallowed ground. A place was chosen, which isn't far from here, called White Ladies Priory. It's, I don't know, about five miles north of Wolverhampton. Um, and it's uh, a ruined monastic building. It's got no roof or anything. It's just ruined walls. The reason we took it there, I seem to remember that some of the people involved in the story believed that that's where the green stone was actually originally fashioned. Now, how that can be so, if we've got it connected with ancient Egypt, is another story about ancient Egyptians coming to Britain and all the rest of it. Uh, I just haven't got the time to explain all that bit. But there was a connection with the Greenstone, with this White Lady's Priory, and about how it, when it might have been fashioned. Now, we went to White Lady's Priory. Marion said that she felt that we had to put this stone, the Greenstone, on a burial mound about 50 yards from the ruined walls of the Priory, where it's uh, a wood, a small wood, surrounded by trees, this mound. And she said that she thought that we, we needed nine of us present. So I think a couple of the people that were there had never had anything paranormal happen to them, ever. Um, they'd never seen anything. So this was going to be a pretty big shock for them. Um, so there was nine of us present. Marion put the stone on this mound. We retreated to within the walls of the Priory, and we had to wait until 9.30 at night. I seem to remember that time was important because of something to do with the planets in that position. It had to be in a certain position, according to Marion, anyway. And because she'd been so right about other things, after all, she'd told us exactly what it would look like and smell like when we found the sword, and exactly what it would look like where we found the stone, um, if that Mary, that, well, if Marion said that this stone was going to cause a, whole, you know, a load of trouble and she could discharge it, then who were we to argue? So anyway, we stood in the, in, in the, uh, within the walls of the Priory, and it was pitch black, half past nine at night, looking back towards this dark copse where the stone had been placed. Now, one of those present was this horticultural officer called Mike Ratcliffe. If you look at my video, you can see him interviewed. Um, he, I don't, he, he, he was basically um, just came along to make up the numbers. Um, he was a horticulture officer for the Parks Department of Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire. And he knew a lot about wildlife animals. And as he said himself, he said, the noises we heard coming from that wood where the stone had been placed at 9.30 were not made by anything in the natural world. Nothing in the animal kingdom ever made noises like these. It wasn't like a bird. It wasn't like a, a fox. It was like... Oh, that just sounds stupid. But it just didn't sound like any... And it was this screeching sound. And it seemed to be above the cops in the air. But it wasn't like a bird. It was just a really weird noise. And then... Suddenly, the, there suddenly came these five flashes in pretty quick succession from where the, where the woodland, where the stone had been placed. And then these five balls of light, probably about three feet across, it's difficult to tell, rose above the trees. 
And we're literally gobsmacked. And it was, there was no doubt that we were actually seeing this and it wasn't a shared hallucination because it lit up the whole area around about. We could all see this. You know, we could just see each other. And we'd been standing there in the dark. And suddenly these balls of light were, were literally hovering about, I don't know, 10 feet above the tallest of the trees. They joined together in one big ball about, I don't know, 8 feet across that slowly moved towards us and then suddenly exploded with this blinding light and an ear-shattering bang. And at this, it went completely quiet. <coughs> and that, suddenly it was like somebody said the words, flee, and we all started to make our back, way back towards the cars. There was no way anyone was going to go in there and get the stone. I think, we, I think Marion got up the next day or something. But we literally, as we ran back to the cars, looking back towards... It, the, the cops where this had all happened, it was dead quiet, but there was no sound of any animals or birds or anything, night birds, it was just completely silent as if nothing had happened. And we got away from there as quickly as possible. And that basically put an end to the strange happenings in the Oaks Crescent headquarters. It stopped falling apart, it didn't, didn't, re, didn't get mended, but it stopped falling apart. Um, as far as I know, nothing has happened there since. It was, uh, it remained empty for a good few years until it was sold off and turned into luxury apartment building. And I think it still is now. And as far as I know, um, nothing really strange has happened there. Not that I know of, it might have, but it certainly hadn't way back. So basically, that is, where am I getting to? How many? Another 15 minutes. Right. Okay. God, I've never done a talk this long before. <laughs> so, um, so that's the story of the actual stone. Now, I'm going to tell you some weird things that have happened since that are going to be in the book that I bring out in the new year. These t this ties up um, more... N okay. What I've been doing is trying to figure out how it was that the order of me and I are... Ah, no, and what I need to tell you about, some, yeah, this is how it started. When we, had, when we got the sword, because the sword was found on land belonging to the Earl of Coventry, it was returned to his estate. The estate manager said, we want this sword. It ended up, the Earl of Coventry, who died about 20 years ago now, 15 years ago, donated it to the Tudor House Museum in the town of Upton-upon-Severn, not far from where the sword was found in this bridge. Now, it was completely by chance that, supposedly, that the Earl of Coventry decided to uh, give the sword to that museum. And it's now there on public display on the wall, in a case, all about the green stone there as well, you know, uh, leaflets telling you all about it, and the stone sword, how it was discovered. What's really bizarre is that very building, which is now the Tudor House Museum, it is a Tudor house, was in, the, in, in 1553, or two, 1553, I think I'll say on the video, 1593, but I mean 1553. It was the home of Dr. John Dee, the very man who was supposed to have had this stone and been the person who founded this order of me and I. And it was, he lived there, it was the rectory of the church right across the street where he had been for a while the priest, because he was a priest before he got involved in the occult and everything. And he was said to be one of the most learned people in Europe. His library was supposed to be the largest in England. And for a while he was a priest. And while he was a priest, he lived in the rectory right opposite. And his lodgings, his room, was exactly where his bed was where the sword ended up. How do things like that happen? Okay, that, so that's a, a weird thing that's happened. Uh, here's some other weird things. Remember I told you about Mary Heath? the lady who founded, or at least ran an, an, a refounding of the order of me and I in the late 1900s. Maybe it had gone underground and resurfaced, maybe she had it refounded. 
but they use the name the Order of Nehemiah. They're the ones that met in this Elizabethan temple, uh, sorry, this Egyptian temple place. Um, the, when we eventually went back to this, myself and a man who is one of, the, one of the people in charge of the National Trust, we went back to film and investigate the recess where Angeline had felt there was something behind the wall where we'd had video footage showing Maya splitting in two and where we'd seen this Victorian looking lady turning around on a video. We found out that there is in fact a sealed room behind this alcove because we worked out how far the actual brickwork goes back. We know it's there. We've even had a, 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 we've found plans that date from the mid-19th century that shows that there was a concealed room behind this alcove, just as Angelina had thought. And it was exactly where the, this ghostly figure appears on this film. You can see all these on my, web, on my Facebook, uh, on my YouTube channel, Graham Phillips uh, Author, that's what it's called, and the, these videos, and Maya splitting in two and that. And we were filming, and this guy from the National Trust, plus um, a friend of his who had come along too, were banging on the walls. They're saying, look, it's hollow. My friend Jody had, had, had filmed this, and when we played it back, he says, banging on the door, saying, hello, hello. And when you, you, play, when you play the film back, he bangs, bang, 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 and then you hear something banging back, bang, bang, bang. We didn't hear that at the time, or if we did, we didn't notice. Bang, 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 bang. He goes, hello, and a girl's voice, a woman's voice says, hello. Of course, that is really creepy. Um, so we're, we're going to actually go in and try and, uh, we're going to try and excavate and see what's behind that wall. But as I was mentioning about Mary Heath, okay, here's some really weird things about her. We have discovered that as a child, she was the very person who inspired the Alice in Wonderland stories. Now, everybody knows Lewis Carroll, Charles Dodson as his real name was, Lewis Carroll, he wrote under that pseudonym, People say that he based Alice on the daughter of his boss at the university where he worked, a girl by the name of Alice Liddell. He always denied this. He certainly dedicated the book to, I mean, he, he was a lecturer in mathematics at, at Oxford University, and um, the little girl's father was the dean of his department, so he was like his boss. So to keep his boss happy, he, he, he um, dedicated the book to Alice Liddell, um, and he does mention, mention her in there. Is that there's, a, there's a kind of anagram at the back, or not an anagram, it's a poem that each letter of each line spells out Alice Liddell. So clearly he based the name Alice on her, but Lewis Carroll decided that what he wanted to do was to... Um, he, he wanted to make sure that the person who did the illustrations of the book used his original drawings exactly, but just coloured them. And he, the picture he's got of Alice, she's got blonde hair, well, you all know what she looks like in the, in the paintings, these, in, in, in the eventual illustrations of the book. She's got blonde hair parted in the middle and long. Alice Little, when you see her, in photographs taken at the time, she's got black short hair and a bob with bangs, or a fringe, as you'd call it in England. Doesn't look anything like her. When the book was actually written, the book was published, Alice Little is 12 and a half, whereas Alice in Wonderland's age in the book is said to be seven. When he first came up with the story, Alice Little uh, wasn't even alive or was a toddler. But where he came up with the story, it's a very, it's a, it's, this is a bit complicated, so I don't want to go into it too much detail. But where he came up with the story, who happened to be staying with him at the time? The father of Mary Heath. Mary was seven years old, and the pictures we've got of her show her to be very, very similar to Alice 
through the looking glass. She's, uh, she's um, got blonde hair. Now, she's the, when, so when he first comes up with the idea, in 1852, and does the first drawings for Through the Looking Glass and for Wonderland stories, he came up with them in tandem, the only little girl has, have, has got anything to do with him at that time, where he's staying as, as, as a tutor, is Mary Heath. And she is seven years old, exactly the age that Alice is. And... This little Mary Heath used to claim, and we've got letters to prove this, she used to claim that she could go into a mirror world where she would find, like, another dimension. And this is so inspired Lewis Carroll that he not only based the story on this Mary Heath, he actually drew the picture of the, the mirror in the house, Hall Cross Hall, as it's called, not far from here, um, where, where, the mirror, where the mirror was. So what I'm saying is, you've got a mirror which, which, which the little girl, Mary Heath, claimed that she could go into and saw different worlds inside there. And this inspired Lewis Carroll to write his story. Now, the thing is that you would say, yes, but she's not called Alice, is she? There's one thing that's never been explained. And that is in the Wonderland story. If you read the original story, you will see that, Mar that, that, that Alice follows the white rabbit down a rabbit hole. And as they, the white, she follows the white rabbit, the white rabbit repeatedly refers to her as, come on, hurry up, Mary Ann. Now, Alice doesn't know why he's calling her Mary Ann. She assumes it's a servant. But n no such servant actually comes into the story at all. So um, three or four times he calls her Mary Ann. Astonishingly, Mary Heath's middle name is Mary Ann. And in all these writings we've found about her now, she's always referred to by her friends as Mary Ann. Now, going back to this mirror, again, this is a, just an, another thing that's completely separate, but ties up with Mary Heath, who is involved in leading the order of Nehemiah from and, and presumably doing rituals in this Elizabethan, uh, in this e mock Egyptian temple, the, um, we took photographs of this mirror. We started to find out that in Horcross Hall, which is now a luxury health resort um, and hotel, loads of people have seen the ghost of a little girl. It's uh, my, my research originally that found out in, in, in very recent times that that mirror in the, what's now the library of Hall Cross Hall is the mirror that inspired the Alice in Wonderland story. Nobody ever knew it, but everybody starts saying that, you know, people have stayed there. Yes, all this place is supposed to be haunted by a, a little blonde girl from the Victorian age. Some people see her in night clothes, but other people see her dressed... In fact, when I was talking to one of the receptionists, she said, well, you know how Alice in Wonderland dresses? That's what she's seen like. The little girl is seen walking around the place. Now, this might sound a bit strange if, you know, how come the ghost of Mary Heath as a child can be stuck in this place when Mary Heath doesn't die until she's an adult? Well, in Japan, there is a... In Shinto, they, can, they believe that you can copy your spirit as some, well, something called a tulpa into a mirror. And you can actually get a mirror, the ancestor in one mirror, and then move it into another mirror and take it to another shrine so somebody else can, can venerate that ancestor. Something like this is what seems to have happened with Mary Heath. Somehow, she got herself... She must have done something in front of this mirror when she was a seven-year-old child that really kind of you know, got Lewis Carroll really excited about this. And also, what... Okay, so, it, she seems to have created a double ghost of herself. Remember I said that something happened in the Egyptian tomb when Maya, who's about, how old is she then, 18 then, or 19, when she split into two, and, and, and the, in, on, the vi on the film anyway, well, it's almost as if Mary Heath was able to make a copy of herself in this mirror, but it's not only seen in the mirror, people see her walking around. One particular guy we spoke to was a barman, a bartender, 
And he walked into this room and in the mirror said he saw, he didn't know anything about the ghost story, he said he saw a girl, the description was like Alice in Wonderland, dressed up as Alice in Wonderland, blonde hair, a blue outfit on and so on, headbands. He thought that she must have been in fancy dress. But the thing was, it was about, um, like, the, 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 the bars had all closed. He was cleaning up the glasses. You know, what was this little girl doing now on her own? So he kind of like, uh, but he only saw her in the mirror from the position he was at the door. He walked into the library and turned, in, turned towards where she was, and she wasn't there anymore. But there was a secret door up the corner, which kind of is behind, it's got, it looks, it looks like a bookshelf. It looks like it's part of the bookshelf, and it leads through to the dining hall. So, um, so I looked into the, so he looks at the, into the mirror, sees the little girl in there, walks into the room, the little girl's not where she was reflected in the mirror, so he goes over to there, look, walks through this secret, secret door into the dining hall, can't see her. So thinking she's messing around and joking around and perhaps run out into the long gallery outside, he goes back in, comes back into where the door is, looks into the mirror, and exactly where he'd been standing is this little Alice in Wonderland girl, reflected in the mirror, kind of laughing at him like this. And, he, and literally, then he runs out, when he, by the time he comes round the corner to look at exactly, to look directly at where this little girl seems to have been, she's vanished. And you're thinking, he, he, you know, he's thinking, my God, you know, where is she? And he can't find her anywhere. And it's only when he then discovers the next day that there were no children staying in a place that night that he realises he'd probably seen the ghost. And when we took a photograph, um, who took this photograph? This photograph, I don't know, was it one I took? I can't remember now. But a photograph was taken earlier in the year of this mirror. And when you blow it up, it could be literally like, you know, you get faces in the fire, like you get wood grain that can look like a face. It really does look like there's this transparent image of a little blonde girl wearing a blue um, dress and just looking down in the corner of the mirror, just where Alice is in the mirror in the original drawings. And I've, 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 I've put this um, uh, photograph up online a few times on Facebook for people to see it, and I'll, I'll keep it, I'll, I'll repost it. But it does, for all the world, look like a little girl, like Alice in Wonderland. But anyway, so <clears throat> all these various things I've been telling you, and I think I'm running out of time finally, all these things I'm telling you, I can't give you an overall explanation at the moment about what's behind it, what has caused all this stuff. All I can is give you some idea of how wide-ranging it is. And I haven't even touched the surface, really, of some of the things that have happened. You'll, in the Green Stone book, you'll find out much, much more about the intricacies involved in these weird happenings. Um, and as I say, I hope by the new year to get a, a new book out with a lot of this new stuff in, like this Alice in Wonderland stuff. Why, how, how was Mary Heath, for example, suddenly able to have the power to copy herself into a mirror, something that only Shinto priests are supposed to do? How could she do it at seven years of age? And what, is the, what was the Greenstone? I mean, people might say, where is it now? I don't know. Marianne Sunderland, who had it in her house for a long time, died a few years ago. And since then, I believe her daughter sold it off, and we have no idea where it is. So, unfortunately, the greenstone, the casket is lost, but we still have the sword, and that hangs on the wall in the Tudor House Museum. And just before I close, Debbie wanted me to. Well, she's gone. Oh, Debbie wanted me to mention something about the pictures. What did you want me to mention? That's not Debbie. Oh, she's not here. Okay. Oh, well, we can always talk about that later on. The pictures. They're photographs. What do I say? What do you want me to say? Part of the raffle prizes. I'm, oh, yes, that's what it was. I remember now. Debbie said that part of the raffle prizes, those two covers of the magazine, Strange Phenomena, is a magazine we were working on 40 years ago from Wolverhampton um, when it all started. And the covers of two of the magazines have been framed 
and are there as part of the raffle prizes. So if you're wondering what Strange Phenomena magazine was, that's what the cover of it looked like. And we, this was way before they had modern computers and that. We had to create all that by sticking things on a piece of paper with glue and then photographing it. Anyway, I think I'd better let you all go now, and thank you very much. I'm really sorry about these microphonic pro problems, but I, that's the most difficult talk I've ever done in my life, because I can hear myself coming back. So please forgive me for not being as good as I normally am. There you go then. Thank you.